Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 9 of Energy versus Climate. My name is Ed Whittingham, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Sarah Hastings-Simon and David Keefe. You will recall, dear listener, that our last show was on March 28th, and that was the day of the Canada of Canada's federal budget. During that show on contract for difference policy that we did with Chris Bataille, if you haven't listened to it, I encourage you to go back and uh, give it a listen. We talked about the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out, that was driving the Canadian federal government following the Biden administration's big bet on clergy in the Inflation Reduction Act. And during that show, we actually speculated on what the counterstrikes might be in the Canadian budget and counterstrikes designed to keep industrial decarbonization capital on this side of the border instead of going down to the side of the border where David currently sits. We've got an update there that we'll, we'll get to in just a moment. Well, in last month's budget on March 28th, the Canadian federal government ended up betting big themselves, and especially on powering the Canadian economy with low carbon electricity. We saw a total of $3 billion in additional support for the next 13 years for grid decarbonization, electrification, 20 billion, that's in the form of grants, 20 billion of support for clean electricity investments through the Canada Infrastructure Bank. That's typically financing. We saw a clean manufacturing tax credit that could apply to manufacturing of renewable energy and energy storage equipment. And finally, we saw a clean electricity investment tax credit that looks like it's for big transmission projects and to support new interprovincial trade of electricity. And all this on top of the tax incentives for wind and solar and low carbon hydrogen that were actually announced last fall in the fall economic statement. So why this big bet on low carbon electricity and why this emphasis in the first place? Why do we need to make this kind of investment when, as some would argue, already over 80% of our current electricity comes from non-emitting sources like hydro, nuclear, wind, and increasingly solar? And what parts of our economy can we reasonably expect to be electrified? What parts can we not expect? And what does this all mean? What does this mean for the fossil fuels we currently use to power parts of our daily lives and parts of our economy? So to help answer these and more electrifying questions, we are joined by Sarah's University of Calgary colleague, Dr. Blake Schaefer. Blake is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Calgary. He works on electricity markets, climate policy, and energy transition, and, and is frequently he frequently provides advisor services to governments at various levels. Blake had, prior to returning to academia, a 15-year career in energy trading. He specialized in electricity, natural gas, and emissions markets. And he is also the author of a recent report entitled Technical Pathways to Aligning Canadian Electricity Systems with Net Zero Goals which is totally is entirely on point for today's discussion. So welcome, Blake. Thanks very much for having me. It's a long-time listener, first-time caller, so I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Great. Well, we're excited to have you on as a guest. Uh, so what we're going to do today is uh, shortly, Blake and I will run through a, a quick and dirty primer session on electrification. And then after that, I'll guide all of us through uh, some Q&A uh, amongst ourselves until 45 minutes past the hour. Then we'll get to the 15-minute Q&A with all of you tuning in. And as always, feel free to send in your questions via the Q&A box throughout the webinar. Don't use the raise hand function or the chat box. But before we get there, David, it looks like you have a new office backdrop, which suggests that you might actually have a new job and would love for you to tell us about it. How did you possibly guess? <laughs> yes, um, I'm at University of Chicago in my new pretty much empty office here uh, with piles of boxes all around that you can't see. So yeah, I've taken a job at U Chicago uh, as the founding uh, faculty director of something called the Climate Systems Engineering Initiative. And this is, at least in my little word, a pretty big deal. Uh, it's the first time that a, a really top research university is committed in a kind of formal uh, 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 formal consultative way to really push seriously on research on these topics of, of solar geoengineering and carbon removal, this intersection we're call, calling climate systems engineering. 
And it, it, we expect it to really be a big effort. There'll be quite a lot of faculty hires and a series of different pieces connected with this. And so that's really quite unprecedented. There've been other small efforts in these topics, like the one I started at Harvard and elsewhere, but they've all been kind of bottom up, driven by a single enthusiast, often against kind of opposition, because there's been um, concern about whether there should be any research on these topics. And this feels really different to have a university do this in a kind of a large scale way. So I'm, I'm really excited and intimidated. Uh, I'll be here a lot of the time the next while, but I'll still be in Canmore. That's still long-term home about a third of the time. And uh, I guess on a note connected with uh, uh, this topic, I on Friday got here, uh, moved into my apartment, met the moving truck, got a new bicycle and a new electric car, my first electric. That's kind of exciting. Awesome. Well, and, and it begs the conversation, an actual longer EVC conversation on climate systems engineering which we've been promising for a while, but we will get to it. And yes, go and ahead. And actually, I should just go on what, and, and on that note, I've had that electric car now for quite a few days and I've been to the airport and back and various places and I still haven't figured out how to charge it because charging is not as convenient as it should be even in my fancy apartment. I mean, I'm not worried that I will fail, but this illustrates the fact that on the ground, even in urban Chicago, it's just not quite as easy as it should be. Well, I hope you do figure out how to charge it. Otherwise, you, you it's plug be a very the large thing into weight. the connector, you know, and then. <laughs> well, I was trying to do it on the cheap in this fancy apartment because there's a lot of just regular plugs, which would, you know, give me some charge overnight, but they seem to have disabled all those. Uh, it does come with a free two years of Electrify America fast DC charging. We certainly will figure out how to charge it, but it just isn't quite as easy as it ought to be. <laughs> Good. Well, we look forward to hearing more about, about your research. Um, so let's, yeah, let's let's turn to Blake. Let's get back to the topic du jour or build upon the topic du jour of, of electrification. So Blake, why the, the, the feds have bet big on electrifying the Canadian economy. And that's also, they bet big on increasing the role of electricity for end use purposes in Canada. Why, why do we need to do that? Yeah, you know, I, I like a quote from Jesse Jenkins, the modeler out of Princeton, um, he's got a great quote about the role of electricity. He calls it the linchpin, sometimes the cornerstone of net zero ambitions for two reasons. So one is we can clean up the production of electricity. So make it cleaner on the supply side. I think you noted at the outset, Ed, that that's an advantage Canada is starting with. So we've got this huge head start in terms of a decarbonized system. Over 80% uh, of generation is zero emission largely due to the historically large hydro systems we have across the country. And so that lends itself into, why don't we take advantage of this fact that we've already got this clean system. The US is sitting around 40 or 50% clean. They've got a, you know, you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like walk and chew gum at the same time. They've got to clean up their system while they electrify to get the benefits out of it. In most of Canada, I'm sitting here in Alberta, so we're the kind of one of the big exceptions. In most of Canada, you can jump right into electrifying other processes or other parts of the economy and get the full environmental benefit of, of leveraging clean electricity. So I think, I think they're looking at that and saying, hey, we can look at transportation uh, across Canada. You know, that swaps between one and two in terms of the biggest sector for emissions. We can electrify that and we don't have the issue in most of the country uh, of of charging those megawatts off of uh, charging those cars off of coal, we can charge it off clean power. Uh, we'll look at trans. Uh, we'll look at um, buildings, so heating. So that'll be another sector. You had Chris Bataille on uh, your last episode. Chris is the specialist I think of when I think about the harder to decarbonize industrial sectors, and so those might trail. But we're already seeing some inroads into some of those areas, like steel and cement, that he looks at. Um, the challenge there is really high heat needed, but but eventually we'll get there. But transportation is really one of those ones. And, you know, David's a prime example there. We've got a recent convert into electric vehicles, not without its challenges, but that's one where the, the switch over is going to be relatively easy. Uh, the cost differences are shrinking. And so I think we're going to see that move very quickly here in the, in the next few years. Gotcha. So, I mean, to, to summarize it's a bet that we're going to electrify parts of our transportation system. We're going to electrify uh, heating for not just residential buildings, but also commercial buildings. We're going to electrify parts of heavy industry, like you know, electrify say cement kilns where where possible. Um, but what? So what degree 
are of increase in electricity supply are we talking about? Just use finger math. And maybe a turn to you, this would be a good time to just touch upon the difference between uh, capacity and generation, because that's going to play out throughout our conversation. Sure, sure, sure. Happy to do that. Um, in terms of numbers, uh, studies differ on this. I always use a rule of thumb is around the doubling of energy, so of actual generation needed, so electricity. So we're going to increase the amount of electricity generated because we're going to be using less en of other energy forms. If you look at overall energy use, this tends to decline because many of our electric uses are more efficient. Um, the car is a great example. You use that electric battery. It's far more efficient than an internal combustion engine uh, because of all that heat that comes out and it's wasted off of internal combustion. The overall energy might decline, but electricity as a share of our final energy use will increase. So a doubling is a good rule of thumb. And I've seen anywhere from an increase of, you know, one and a half to three to four. Um, and that probably depends on just the extent of electrification that occurs. The thing you mentioned, generation for capacity, I love that. That's part of my like lecture one in my electricity markets course. Uh, Sarah and I taught a electricity 101 for journalists workshop for a few years. And we also use that because it often gets confused. Um, so Think of capacity, we measure that in units of watts or megawatts. That's the instantaneous ability to provide power. So instantaneous, it's like a flow. Energy would be measured in watt hours or kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. So if we have something that can produce one megawatt and it runs for one hour, it produces one megawatt hour of energy. And that's actually what we use. So think of that as some stock, some amount. Um, so... This matters a lot as we move to a system that has a lot more renewables in them, because historically, energy and capacity were kind of coupled. Uh, you have a gas plant, it's got 100 megawatts of capacity, you can rely on it maybe 80 to 90% of the time to deliver you 100 megawatt hours over an hour. Uh, with wind and solar, that changes. So we're kind of decoupling this concept of firm capacity and the energy it produces. So we're likely to see a larger build out of capacity uh, because the assets that we're going to have in the system with more renewables run at a slightly lower capacity factor. They run less frequently. So ballpark numbers, solar, you can think about getting around 20%, wind around 40%, uh, whereas a gas plant, an efficient gas plant would be somewhere around 70 to 85%. And so... We'll probably, we'll be getting a lot more energy out of these other sources, but we'll need more capacity to deal with the lower capacity factors. Okay, so generation capacity have been moving roughly in lockstep to date, but if you need to double generation, then finger math again, you what likely need to triple, triple capacity? Perhaps more, perhaps even more so. Now, one thing I think we'll get into today, this is really the area of focus for me in my research, is the answer to that question, how much extra capacity you need really depends a lot on when you're going to need the electricity. To the extent we can be flexible on our demand and, and start moving demand around, you need less capacity. Historically, we don't like to do that. You know, when I want my electricity, I want my electricity. And I don't think that's going to change uh, for a lot of people. But there's some margins where it will be possible. Again, I'll go back to EVs. That's a really... Uh, interesting area that we can talk about in terms of more flexibility there. So to the extent we can have some more flexibility on the demand side, we won't need as much capacity on the supply side. Um, that is a really interesting area because there's technical engineering aspects, but really the bulk of it is social. It's behavioral. It's, it's how we're going to interact. And it's asking people to potentially change the way they interact with their electricity system, which will deservedly get some pushback. And so I, I'm really interested in that because there's huge savings to be had if we can get some more flexibility. Sure. Well, maybe you can expand upon that because, you know, a change in how consumers think about their relationship with electricity. So I'd say my relationship with electricity right now is, is parasitic or one way. I demand and it supplies. Yeah. So what, what, what kind of change are you talking about? Yeah. So let me use a concrete example of something where like EVs. So EVs are interesting because unlike most electrical devices, when we want the service that comes out of them, say a light bulb, we want the light, that's uh, coincident with when we have the electric draw. 
Those two things happen at the same time. Because of those that big battery that's sitting in David's car, that isn't the case for EVs. The driving service, moving that, you know, moving around your city isn't going to be at, happen at the exact same time when you're charging. So we decouple that. And by decoupling that, that gives us tremendous flexibility. We probably don't have flexibility around when we want to use the service. You know, when David needs to commute to work, he's going to commute to work. There's small margins of adjustment there. But there might be a lot of flexibility around when we charge. And so what do we need to think about rather than just, you know, come home, plug in at 5 p.m., which is really going to lead to a huge increase in capacity needs if everybody is coming home, adding to what is already a peak at about 5, 6 p.m. with, you know, lighting and uses around their home. All of a sudden, everybody's charging in a level two charger, which draws around six to 10 kilowatts, which is three to four times a normal home. And everybody's doing that. That just means we need a ton of capacity in the peak. We need to encourage people to, to, to change when that happens. So one is we need incentives. And I've got some studies and there's been others where we show like a moral suasion, a nudge, it does nothing. It really does sad, but it does nothing. You need some incentives. You need some money on the line. And it can be really small is what we're finding, like really small. Um, but you also need to make it easy. And that is the key thing. And I think that's sort of common sense to most of us. Um, you need to make it easy for folks to shift. Asking people to run around the house, turning lights off or changing when they heat their oven, those, those aren't going to work. You know, there's just, there's inflexibility there and there's uh, too much opportunity cost in your time. Um, but making it easy and increasingly we can because all of these devices are connected now through telemetry. I can use my phone and talk with my, my car. I can use my phone and talk with my oven. I, I'm not that bored or lonely to do so yet, but it's, it remains an option. Um, but EVs especially, there's apps now where we can control it really easily. Um, and, uh, and it's also material. You know, asking people to do this for saving money on one kilowatt hour shifting, if that's a dollar per kilowatt hour, it's a big number. Um, they're not going to do that. Run around and create discomfort in your home, save a dollar. You know, I, I risk, you know, leaving a cold shower for my spouse for, and tell her I made a dollar. That's not going to work. But an EV has a 75 kilowatt hour battery in, in some of them these days. If you can save a dollar per kilowatt hour, avoiding some critical peak, you're going to do that. And it doesn't have to be that much by any means, but uh, all of a sudden the dollars start to add up. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it gets, gets to that challenge of, for instance, just because my phone can talk to my thermostat doesn't mean I'm actually going to use my phone to talk to my thermostat if I really don't have a strong incentive to do so. But let's, so Sarah, I'd love to turn to you. You, you look at electricity a lot. So, you know, Blake had just mentioned that generation capacity uh, you know, needs to triple or higher, let's say quadruple. That's that's aggressive for us to get to net zero. When we face nimbyism, we face bananaism, you know, the more virulent cousin of nimbyism, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. We require these behavioral changes of people. We need to do this to get to a net zero grid, and we've got some regulatory sticks and carrots. But it still seems aggressive when the challenges are often societal and and political rather than just purely economic. Yeah, I mean, two two thoughts on that. I mean, you definitely make it make it sound challenging. I think one thing to keep in mind um, when we think about the build out that we need and you know that doubling of uh, electricity, say let's call it to, out to twenty fifty, you know that translates to something like two and a half percent of growth per year, which is really significant if we compare that to the last decade or so um, of growth in electricity in um, Canada and in North America. But it turns out that that's actually that last decade is sort of special in that it was a decade where we actually made some really significant progress in energy efficiency, a lot of it coming from lighting in that case. So, um, you know, LEDs and really being able to reduce the amount of energy that we need that really uh, cut the, the, the growth. And so if you go back a little bit earlier to the period from, say, 1960 to 1990, um, we saw electricity growth in Canada of 4.8% a year during that period. So um, almost double the kind of growth that we're talking about we had. Now, granted, as you said, I think that there were perhaps less issues of um, of NIMBYism during that period, and our and you know arguably also there was there was much less um, 
you know, kind of proper consultation um, with uh, with First Nations groups. Um, and, and so I'm not proposing that we, you know, go back and do everything like we did uh, in the 70s. But I do think that that's an important metric to keep in mind in that, you know, this is a challenge that we have to build, but it's not a challenge that we haven't, um, you know, in some ways done before. Uh, I think the other thing when it comes back to electricity and particularly, you know, the significant amount of electricity that we use in our homes um, is that it is, you know, it's it's about finding different ways to make this attractive to people and make it work and make it work for them, right? Like Blake was saying, you know, there's opportunities to have savings that are material and that gets people excited. Um, there are opportunities to have um, ways that you're using electricity um, to do things that are actually just more convenient or more comfortable. You know, when we talk about electrifying uh, heating in homes and, and doing that, you know, yes, there's an element of an efficiency piece there, but making a home that's more efficient um, and that has a, a better um, heating system um, that's also just a comfort issue as well, too. And so I think that we do have to get away from kind of selling this, if you want, as just purely at, well, we've all got to do this because of the uh, climate challenge mm -hmm. and look for the opportunities that are going to get people excited about. Maybe it's not talking to their uh, oven with their phone, though I have to admit, I have used my phone to preheat my oven uh, to make dinner while I was uh, on a call. So it can even that even that can be convenient as well, too. Yeah, can quick I story add to that, Ed? Sure. Yeah, go right. ahead. Um, oh. cause I, Sarah said this before, and I, I fully agree with her. When we're forecasting the future and looking historically at like, well, we've, we haven't built that many batteries. How are we going to build that many batteries? A lot of the you know, past gives us an indication, but it doesn't portend the need because we didn't need to. So why would we look at flexible demand? We've never done that. We've never gotten people to be comfortable with that because we didn't need to. We had a system that was comprised of dispatchable, flexible supply. As that's changing, we need to change our mindset. We also have the technology. The other one on the build out, I fully agree with, with what Sarah said there. Yeah, we haven't seen that type of growth because energy efficiency has slowed down the need for it. However, if you look at a, a microcosm of Canada, if you look at Alberta, we did get that kind of growth because we had that massive industrial growth. So we were building probably around two to 3% per year um, because of the electrical need for the oil sands, largely. So there's a huge electrical need there, and we did it. And so it is possible when it's needed. Yeah, and, we, and we've and we had explosive growth, frankly, of, of solar generation in Alberta in the last uh, three years that has exceeded even the most optimistic of forecasts. All right, David, I know you've done a lot of work electricity uh, earlier in career. The first time, actually, I met you, you came in to talk about some of the research you'd done on uh, large scale wind generation. And I remember you talking about some of the exciting challenges that we would have around decarbonizing grids. So what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, that was a great primer, but I guess I have a couple of nerdy uh, comments to say. One is it's important to be clear about the difference between capacity factor and availability. So capacity factor, as you know, is the average amount the system asks for something to produce as a fraction of its peak. So yeah, wind is sort of, with solar is 20-ish and, and, and uh, gas plants are 70-ish, but availability is the fraction of time that they're there if you ask for them. And and gas plants are typically in the high 90s for availability. And in terms of uh, of the challenges of managing the plant, that's really a better comparison. The point is the 20% for solar is just as much as there is for solar. The 70% for a gas plant and some gas plants will be higher and lower is an economic outcome of a system that's trying to optimize for lowest cost. So it's really not, you got to be careful comparing those numbers. I guess another thing to say is... Uh, Maybe I'm just picky about this, but I think I think it's very fair to call um, uh, 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 wind or uh, solar or hydro um, zero emission because they're effectively zero emission. No problem with that. I, I, I'd be a little cautious about just blanketly calling them clean. There's no question that fossil fuels are terrible and that we need to move away from fossil fuels. But but these alternatives are not necessarily so perfectly clean, and particularly on some environmental measures, hydro is pretty bad. And wind also has significant land use footprints and, and even a climate footprint. That's not to say that given a choice, of course, I would choose wind over coal, but uh, any large energy system has impacts. And I think one thing I worry about is in our rush to deal with the climate problem, which we have to deal with, that we forget other environmental consequences that we need to 
keep thinking about. Yeah, that's a good point, David. And though we can trust the opponents of renewable electricity, and there are many out there to always remind us that there is no free lunch when it comes to energy, which we talk about a lot on the show. And going back to when I first met you, uh, and perhaps I've said this before, but I think you said when large uh, production and you're imagining the sort of the heartland of North America, you know, full of wind turbines and the the uh, the spots for the highest wind resource, you thought the environmental benefit to liability ratio might be 20 units of benefit to one unit of liability. And you revise that down to probably five units of benefit to one unit of liability. If well, I it depends. I, I, I think I would try to never do that without saying what benefit. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think the specific thing I remember saying to, when you had me talking to the Pemina leadership at one point was I looked at the Pemina website and it just talked about uh, bioenergy as like a clean energy source. And I tried to really shake you guys up and say, look at what happened in the UK. We switched to being dominantly uh, fossil fueled from dominantly biofuel around 1800. And it was because there was kind of environmental holocaust where that use of biofuels was just immensely destructive. And I think there certainly may be places where biofuels are the right answer, but I was trying to poke you guys a little bit to say there's kind of a problem with a group that's an environmental group, and the sort of that's the, the, the sticker on the can is environmental group, just kind of unabashedly saying biofuels might be a good thing when we have this just immense historical and ecological knowledge that they can be hugely harmful. So I, I get that we all sort of know that, we certainly say this in the show a lot, but I think I think that certainly gets lost in current environmental advocacy, and it's important that we keep thinking about that balance because we have real choices to make as we decarbonize. Yeah, I remember that time you briefed PEMDA's leadership, and you and I went canoeing together on the Solstice float after that. Some of my colleagues, after you poked them, wanted me to poke you out of my canoe yeah, while I know. we're sort of mid-river. <laughs> All right. Luckily, Let's... you restrained them. I, I, yeah, I, I've showed great restraint over the years, great restraint. Um, but actually, maybe just one, I really like the way, uh, sorry, Blake and Sarah both ended. I think one way to to talk to people is to show them this steady kind of century-long increase in the fraction of final energy, which is electricity. I think there really is a deep way in which, it, which because of climate, we have to accelerate the transition, but we're pushing the system in the way it was moving anyway, which is basically to electrify everything. Uh, let's so let's talk about uh, on this feasibility question. Let's talk about transmission because and Blake, maybe I could turn back to you. Why should transmission? I I, I constantly hear of transmission being a bottleneck, and particularly in this province where it's become terribly politicized. I don't quite understand why it should be a bottleneck when we've got non wire solutions at our disposal, and we've actually, I mean, to Sarah's point. Sure, it's not the the halcyon days of the 1970s where we're building new generation capacity here, new pipelines there, social license wasn't even a term, but we are clearly still building generation capacity. We're building new transmission, but everyone talks about it being this massive barrier. We could say, okay, well, it's a barrier. It's going to be difficult to build. We'll build less, but we also have non-wire solutions at our disposal. You know, we've got in this province, in Cypress County, uh, a solar project, Jurassic, coming online next year, 220 megawatts AC with 80 megawatt hours of battery storage. And there are more, plenty more examples like that. So help me to understand why transmission continues to remain the sticking point. Sure. Well, let me start with where you just left, though, on non wire solutions, which perfectly correct what you just said. Those will be increasingly useful because... We've now got this situation where we're building a lot of solar in the south and the really southeast part of our province where there wasn't as much generation before. And so if you're going to build transmission to meet the peak of solar, say it's a 200 megawatt uh, solar farm, Jurassic, and that line's only going to get used 20% of the time, if that was the only thing there, that's clearly going to be an expensive proposition to add it on. Now, obviously, you're going to have other assets, so you're going to try to increase the utilization rate of that transmission line. But if you can co-locate storage, what that does is not just about smoothing the generation of solar into the evening. It's not really about that. It, it, it's, it's, it's doing that for the sake of um, using more transmission, allowing us to build less than the peak solar output of transmission and get a higher utilization rate on the transmission. So that's going to be really important as we build out in new parts of the province that we think about that co-locating aspect to allow us to build less transmission for the for these same assets, get a higher utilization rate. 
Where transmission presents as a real bottleneck, in my view, is when we start talking about things like interprovincial transmission. There's already challenges building in province, but interprovincial in Canada is a beast into itself. Um, largely because in Canada, every electric, every province is really its own master of its electricity system. And they also have very different structures. Most of Canada is on a traditional cost of service uh, monopoly um, utility, often government owned. Alberta is very different in that it's a competitive generation system. And so trying to connect those is really challenging because there's, um, there's really differences in outcomes. You have a lot of different players with different roles here that stand to gain or lose uh, with different power in terms of their voice and, and how much they're heard. And so tying those together is challenging. And there's just the general aspect of building linear infrastructure in this country and all, you know, U.S. as well is, is hard. Yesterday, there was actually an announcement, the Trans West Express, which is a very large high voltage DC line running from Wyoming wind down into the Nevada, California border. It got approval from the, I think it's the Bureau of Land Management yesterday to start construction. That's a big deal. That was first proposed, tw uh, where are we now, tw tw 2023, it was first proposed in 2006. So however, however many years that is, that's how long it's gotten to the point of, okay, shovels in ground. And, and we're not that much better here. So that, that, that's one of the issues we face in terms of building out transmission is you have uh, the different players who stand to benefit, who are going to create opposition. You have traditional uh, land rights and treaty rights challenges of building linear infrastructure, um, mega project risks. Um, so there's a lot of obstacles. The reason folks like me and Sarah and others you know, speak so highly of this is pretty much every study you look at in terms of the cost of decarbonizing shows how much cheaper it is to try to decarbonize electricity supply when you aren't just making yourself little electric islands, when you can you know, it's like principles of trade. I'm an economist. So when you can trade with your neighbor, you're going to find some advantage. And BC Alberta makes a great case because we have a much better solar and wind resource here. We have much higher capacity factors uh, of those two things. BC is much lower and it's higher cost in terms of the sites they have to build them. BC has much better assets in terms of flexible capacity. They've got a lot of storable hydro and about to add to that with Site C. And so the mix there, the trade, and it's a two-way trade, is really mutually beneficial. Um, and I've been trying. I've been working on this for many years. I've worked on both sides. I was at BC Hydro for part of my career. I was at TransAlta for part of my career. I advise both governments. Um, but there's a lot of obstacles. I won't, uh, I won't pretend there aren't. I've yeah, advocated at both governments for a thing. I've, I mean, I feel like we've tried forever. It's, it, there's just a way in which it seems to get no traction. It's but, really hard. The only difference now, of course, like, you know, so my dad is actually an economist as well. It's uh, <laughs> the, the family business. Uh, he told me, like, he went to the Senate, uh, Canadian Senate, and presented on the Grid West proposal, I think, in 1984. <laughs> so the same concept. And then here I am doing the same testimony 40 years later. Um, yep. The big difference is there wasn't much reason to do it before. You know, everybody was self-sufficient, mostly trade with our U.S. neighbor, bigger markets. The biggest difference now is this push for decarbonization. That's the increased value. So that's why you have the Fed suddenly really motivated, excited, willing to throw some serious dollars at it. Uh, I'll, I don't know if I can be political at all on here, Ed, but I'll, uh, the, the yes. Trump years showed us that you know relying solely on the U.S. as a main trading partner is potentially risky. Um, so having a little bit more east-west connection. I'm not talking about trend across Canada wires. It'll be regional. But having a little bit more trade within the country and a little less reliance on the U.S. is probably not a bad idea to diversify a little bit that way. Yeah. And going back to budget 2023's big bet on electrification. So there is a new tax credit in there that is a clean electricity investment tax credit largely for crown corporations. Mm -hmm. It's eligible for taxable, non-taxable entities, but it's seen as a big bet and a big fund for crown corps for big transmission projects, and it's eligible for interprovincial. The challenge is, it isn't so much economic, it's that to what you're talking about, and, and we've talked about a lot on the show, Blake, um, 
you know, we know where the strategic interties are, but there's interprovincial politics, crown corporations, little fiefdoms, all these barriers. And uh, one intertie that also makes sense is between Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Yep. But you've got SAS Power, Manitoba Hydro at each other's throats. And Manitoba is going through a drought period. So right now, you know, you could say, all right, well, this, we want to do this, but Manitoba would say, hey, you know, if we're worried and we're hydro-based and we're going through this drought, the last thing we want to do is be exporting our electricity to Saskatchewan right now. And oh, by the way, we don't like each other. Yeah. Yeah. Although I'd say on those two, you're right. They don't necessarily like each other, but there has been a little bit more cooperation, smaller scale, but there actually are some deals and some transmission expansion happening. It's in a way a little bit easier because they're two crown corps. So yeah, maybe sometimes they butt head, but at least they have the same structure. And so deals are a little bit more possible. I mean, that one's a great example. If you think about if that was one uh, Saskatoba, and they were looking at decarbonizing Saskatoba. Well, you've got, I mean, they just built the Kiosk Dam, which instead of dealing with Saskatchewan, they deal with Wisconsin and North Dakota in contracts. They have the Kanawapta Hydro Facility as their next big project. And I fully agree with what David said in terms of caution around, you know, mixing up clean versus zero emission. Like large, large reservoir hydro is not <laughs> without environmental consequences. So you won't really want to think through that. Um, but if if it, if it still made sense, there there's a massive potential decarbonization with flexibility, very close in terms of being able to connect through to a region that doesn't have those types of options. I think the point is we have a bunch of hydro now. And for the hydro we have, we have this terrific resource that we could use to help manage intermittency that really is a kind of national treasure, even if that treasure was bought at big environmental cost. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't resist. You kind of implied that big hydro is the problem and small hydro is somehow better. I have, uh, that's a common claim in the environmental community. I've looked hard for evidence to back up that claim, but I've never found it. Well, I Sarah, would say the biggest I, I, difference I, there would be the reservoir, the flooding and the Sure, but you've methane. got to measure it, got it, but you've got to measure it in 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 per mm -hmm. unit benefit yeah. and and run of river has lots of impacts. So I think it's, it's one of these common things that advocates like to say where you search, I've literally spent hours looking. I just don't think there's evidence to back it up. <laughs> Okay, that I want to bring Sarah matter. back in. Sarah, love to get your thoughts in transmission. And then uh, I'd love to talk about local stakeholder concerns. Mm. Um, you know, I'd made this sort of flippant quote about the halcyon days of the 70s when we we're building energy infrastructure left, right, and center. It's harder today. Social license is an issue. And frankly, in the province where three of us sit right now and where David spends a third of his time, we have real local stakeholder concern around the explosive growth that we've seen, particularly in solar electricity in the last few years. And we've got a premier who, frankly, has been on the warpath uh, against renewables, and it could very well become a, a pointy election issue. But Sarah, your thoughts? Yes, I mean, start, maybe starting with the interties, you know, I think I, I mean, I come to all of this with a technical background, right? But I think the more time that I've spent and is looking at these challenges, the more convinced that I am that it's really not so much in many cases about the technology, but about the people or the structures that they're operating in. And I think that's very true for the intertie situation. And, you know, when it comes to especially the crown corporations, but then also the um, entities that regulate, you know, Alberta's deregulated market, I think one of the big challenges there is that they simply don't have a strong enough mandate and a strong strong enough requirement to look at decarbonization and to have that as a target or a goal at the same level that they have, um, you know, providing electricity, uh, reliability, uh, cost, things like that. So I think that that, you know, until you get there, it's going to be very hard to get the kind of coordination that we actually need because as, um, you know, as, as I think Blake was saying before, the the, the big thing that pushes us towards interties as a solution is the decarbonization challenge, right? And so as long as you say that you should decarbonize, then, you know, every study that I've ever seen uh, about Canada shows that it's, you know, completely advantageous to do so by building interties. If you're not necessarily trying to do that, it's, you know, it, it may still make sense because there's trade, but it's harder to make the case. And that is, I think, um, part of the challenge when you go back to, you know, these crown corporations, you can have individuals within them 
that have say good intentions or you can have sort of a general sense of oh yes we want to somehow you know reach these decarbonization goals but they both you know by law are following these very strict um you know mandates that they have around what they need to prioritize and what they need to focus on and then also simply they are you know all individuals working within a within an institution and and so they you know have their own views and opinions and so i think that to me one of the biggest pieces missing that you know it, and i'm not trying to say that it's going to solve all these other questions that we're going to talk about in a second but it will i think still go a long way towards saying you know if everybody if every crown corporation across canada every crown uh, you know electricity corporation across canada had the mandate of decarbonization at the same level you know obviously we need to have reliable electricity it needs to be cost effective but if we could add that third pillar of the stool of it needs to be zero carbon um that would i think really change the way that those different organizations and groups are working with each other and lead to a lot of that collaboration where, you know, if you're worried about your drought year, what you might actually do then is look at, you know, can there be wind and solar development that happens in Saskatchewan that helps to, you know, we can be importing that power in Manitoba in a certain way. Um, and, and I think that then ties to this broader question of, you know, landowner impacts and, and stakeholder concerns, where I, you know, I think one of the challenges that I see there is that there are two pieces to it, or I would separate it out into two distinct groups, right? And I think there is one group, and this is starting to be better documented, right? There's one group of these concerns that are really not legitimate concerns. And, and there, there's a second group. So I'm not saying that everybody who has concerns sits in this bucket, but there is a significant effort ongoing by legacy uh, you know, fossil fuel producers to create, sometimes people call it, you know, astroturfing, but to create this sense of concern um, and give the impression that there are a local or landowner or, you know, community concerns that are simply trying to prevent an acceleration of a transition, right? And that is, I think, very effective. And I, I imagine that, you know, groups are doing this, uh, organizations are doing this because it's very effective. It very much mixes with, you know, the real concerns that individuals have around how we create consultative processes that don't just run roughshod over, you know, environmental and uh, land uh, uh, concerns. Um, I think on the second one, you know, with good processes in place, I think you can get there not least of which because as a, the systems as a whole are much lower impact when they are renewable than the fossil alternatives. And so, you know, I think you can arrive at that um, out, at that better outcome. But I think one of the biggest challenges is the mixing in of this sort of delegitimate concerns, if you want, um, that, that are being manufactured. And let's not discount the the increasing distrust of institutions and particularly public institutions. And if you look where a lot of the development is happening and the explosive growth in renewable energy and particularly in solar, it's gone from 75 megawatts to 1100 megawatts in, in three years. It's like in the analogy I heard recently, it's like the car replacing the buggy in terms of you know electricity generation locally. But this is in a place where uh, a lot of Landowners and municipalities, they're saddled with orphan wells, they've lost their property taxes, and they've frankly been screwed over by not all, but some parts of the oil and gas sector. And they don't think that the regulator, um, even if it's a different regulator, it's not the AER, the Alberta Energy Regulator, it's the AUC, the Alberta Utilities Commission, they don't, they don't think they're protecting them from basically orphan wells 2.0. Mm -hmm. And these big public institutions say, don't worry, trust us. And we've got this massive movement of, no, we don't trust you. And so we're going to put up these barriers to you kind of doing what you want to do when we have control over our home turf. But yeah, and I think that points to part of the solution, right? Which is you have to actually go back and fix the orphan wells 1.0. I think that's not indistinct from the challenge of, you know, the next yep. round of infrastructure that you want to build in a region, you know, especially in a region like Alberta, where you're living with that challenge. Because of course, why, you know, you can say trust us. And I mean, I think there is something to the argument that the underlying economics of it all is a bit different because you're not, you know, getting to a point with a solar farm at the end of its useful lifetime that it's, you know, really just a liability. You can either keep it running or reduce develop it. So it's, I would argue it's an easier problem. But I but yeah, I mean, I think that that's all the more reason that we should be, you know, doubling down on on fixing the orphan well problem now. Yeah. And and I was I was at the Canada Strong and Free Network conference, which is the annual 
uh, premier gathering conservatives in the country. I was joke. I was like the uh, the hen let loose in the fox house when progressive like me comes in. But full kudos to them for inviting me in and letting me say my piece. Uh, premier Danielle Smith spoke there the day before, and she said three things about electricity. She said, well, energy. She said, Alberta is a natural gas basin and heating stoves. Electricity should be natural gas based. Our grid instability this winter is due to solar and wind. And the federal vision for Alberta is making Albertans dependent on unstable energy. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a softball, by the way, a log ball, Blake, if you want to get political on this show. If, uh, <laughs> and maybe, maybe we'll give you 30 seconds on that, and then we're going to start taking questions from the audience. Oh, great, great. Um, you know, a lot to go by there. Um, I like what Sarah said. We've got to fix Orphan Wells 1.0 because that is being leveraged as a opposition to something that is materially different, solar farms, because, you know, you deplete an oil well, you don't deplete the sunshine. You can repurpose that <laughs> right away with new panels. Um, but that is being used for opposition is what about the end of life liabilities on solar? Wait, maybe we need to impose bonding requirements on solar. Yet <laughs> we have this massive oil and gas end of life liability where that's not seemingly part of the discussion. On the instability thing, just briefly there, um, I mean, this is something where I would say there's this issue of like the, the, the perils of bad forecasting becoming a, a real problem. So we're not alone here in Alberta. The, the International Energy Agency puts out a solar forecast every year that becomes almost a running joke because every year needs to be increased. It's systematically under forecast every, year in, year out. It's a classic chart. We have the same version of it here in Alberta. Our system operator has a forecast of renewables and even la 2021 was the most recent one, and they forecast less solar in 2030 than I think we have now. And that was the reference case. And we can joke about it. You know, they're my friends, so I can chide them. But here, here's the real issue with that. Here we are now in 2023. We have 5,000 megawatts of wind and solar on the system. And these are what we call inverter-based resources. So they don't provide something that is crucial to the grid, which is frequency response. This is the you know, millisecond to a couple second responsiveness that deals with, you know, Ed plugging in his toaster. It's not a generator going up and down, it's frequency regulation. And so this is a stability issue. This is, this is the problem. And so what has the grid operator done? They're responded by saying, uh, maybe we're at a threshold for inverter-based resources. We need to look at spinning resources that are in fossil fuels. We need to curtail the intertie. So they're curtailing the intertie down to one quarter of its capacity so that they can lean on the intertie to provide this in times of need. That's clearly not going to bode well, A, with our neighbors, and B, for the prospects of expanded interties. They have a plan to procure frequency response assets over time, and this can easily be done with batteries. They're a great resource for providing frequency response. So we have solutions. We're not alone in this. They have a plan to procure that, but it won't be ready for till 2025. So for the next two years, we're going to be dealing with some instability potential. So there's that's the reliability challenges. And we're going to face higher costs of electricity because we're curtailing imports during peak periods. And those are essential. It's like a large power plant effectively equivalent. And this could have all been avoided if we had forecast a reasonable level and gone and got ahead of the issue with all of the solutions that are out there from batteries to making wind and solar grid forming rather than grid following to improve demand response uh, products. So uh, I can see this report, which just came out being something that's waved around as yet another, you know, sort of knock on wind and solar when it, it I don't think I interpret it that way. I interpret that as bad planning. Yeah. Well, I want to turn to questions now, but you, to your point about me turning, uh, plugging in my toaster, true story. My wife and I were looking at new microwaves over the weekend, and uh, the one that we were interested in, the shopkeeper said, well, it's not Wi-Fi enabled. Are you okay with that? And I was like, why would I ever need Wi-Fi my, to talk to my microwave through my phone? But you know, maybe in terms of demand response, I need to block out the hours when my daughter will heat her bunny pasta in the microwave so that we're properly managing the load. All right, uh, Robert Tremblay, uh, well known to EBC listeners, you've got a question around uh, uh, hydro provinces and decarbonization. Robert, we unmuted you. 
Hey, you guys can hear me? Sorry, I had to full sure screen can. there. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So the question is, well, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, the Maritimes, there's more work to be done in decarbonization. In many of the hydro provinces, there's been a pretty slow uptake of non-hydro generation, um, maybe with the exception of Quebec. So we're getting legacy hydro utilities to take renewables more seriously as a source of energy be a challenge to roughly doubling the amount of energy from electricity in Canada. Okay, I'm happy to three faces. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in here. I mean, I think maybe, maybe I pre-answered this one a little bit in terms of saying, you know, I think part of it is really needing those legacy utilities to have the mandate to consider that. Um, and, and part of that is really having their governments basically give that mandate to the utilities to do so. Um, but I do also think that, yeah, there is a challenge and it's not, you know, I don't want to come across as, as knocking the people that are working for these utilities is that's not the intention. But I think Think that it is challenging when there is rapid change within a sector, right? And I mean, as we just talked about, that manifests itself in a deregulated electricity market like Alberta, where you end up having, um, you know, it's individual companies that are making the choice to build. And so they build much faster than the system operator is expecting it. Um, I think the way that manifests itself in the um, in the crown corporations and the regulated utilities is that the, they are probably not building as fast as, you know, would make economic sense. And that can be, you know, things as simple as access to information and access to um, prices, you know, having a lag to them. And so when we have a situation where the costs, say, of renewable are falling quickly um, and you have uh, you know cost data from a couple years ago that you're using for your integrated resource planning um, that can lead to outcomes that say you know you shouldn't build this next solar wind farm instead you should do something else and you know not to turn this into an argument about whether you know deregulated electricity systems are, are better or worse for decarbonization but i think on this one specific point we've seen that the deregulated systems where you do have you know competitive um generators coming in who are able to kind of you know that's their that's their business is to be looking at how to make money out of this and they're able to you know move more quickly and be more nimble um they're also you know, able to be in this situation where they they don't some of them don't say own those older assets um, that would be um, you know see see less generation or less utilization as a result of the build out of renewables and that is I think another you know well documented challenge too so you know I think that there is a challenge there you know flip the challenge on its head though and say that there's a massive opportunity and if you get this right you can get those um crown corporations to to move quickly um and and um you know be be thoughtful about where they're building and and put the full power of the the state behind that build out yeah and i'd, I'd say if you're in a hydro province and you're a crown corp and what you know is hydro i'd also know like where is the new mega hydro going to be developed like after after Site C, after Muskrat Falls and the boondoggles and the public concern and the cost overruns, um, I may be missing it, but I have a tough time seeing large new hydro going ahead in the in in Canada when the alternatives right now are are much cheaper. Maybe that's yeah, I a think simplistic that's true. View, but- I mean, I think there's I've seen some interesting numbers. I don't have them in front of me, but there is some uh, room for some upgrading of turbines on existing facilities. Right. And so I think that is part of, you know, we need to we need to be looking at an all of the above solution. I usually hate that. But uh, but when it comes to hydro, I think we should be looking at turning over those rocks of where can we be getting more out of our existing assets? Yeah. Looks like David maybe knows. more. Yeah, there. I mean, I just I agree so strongly. And I also want to add uh, I really agree with what you said earlier, Sarah, about the the challenge of citing and the need to get the crown corporations to think differently. And that's really about the citing laws. But on the point you just made, which I also agree with, I think it's crucial for Canada to fund some kind of strategy and study to look at its existing hydro resources and ask not about adding new total capacity, but about adding the ability to swing that capacity up and down, being clear that's not going to be cost-free or environmental impact-free, but it's a huge potential benefit. We need some kind of serious study to play off the benefits of using hydro as a way to manage intermittency because it's still much cheaper than batteries against the risks on a site-by-site basis, doing the engineering, really understanding how we do it because it's a really unusual national resource that we have. My, my first job at BC Hydro was exactly that, David. This was 1999, um, was, was looking at changes to our ramp rates 
Uh, mm -hmm. So the movement of up and down and also looking at the adding of more turbines and existing dams. So I, I don't know if uh, Quebec probably does this too, but BC built their dams with empty slots for yep. more turbine expansion. And so those are great incremental projects. Um, but, but, and also maybe pump storage. So in places where you've got a dam and a river and a little mm -hmm. bit, you got to ask how much it would cost yeah. to add a little incremental pumped. Yeah. And then you've got to have some coherent way to look at the trade-off. Uh, I agree. Mm -hmm. New, new. I mean, Site C is over ten thousand dollars a kW, as well as being an environmental disaster. It's an economic disaster. So I think new hydro is not what we want. But figuring out how to deal with the hydro we have and even add a pump storage is something we should look at very seriously. Absolutely. And let's not forget it's it's an archaeological disaster too, environmental, economic, yeah. and archaeological. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. I want to I want to get to get us to another question. Uh, Tom Cullen, uh, I'm going to read your question. Uh, Ontario has just announced a new TOU system, uh, TOU's time of use system, with ultra low overnight rates of from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. of 2.4 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, daytime rates of over 20 cents per kilowatt hour. And this is the uh, particularly for EV charging. What do you think about this approach? Blake, can we turn to you? Yeah, I can speak. I'm running a pilot right now. I just finished with, with NMAX, which is the utility here in the city of Calgary where we offered a discounted overnight rate, not that cheap, that's amazingly cheap. Um, that would be the equivalent of, so the per kilometer equivalent would be five cents a liter for a gasoline car. So that I mean, this is really, really cheap. Wow. But what we found was that before offering any incentives, when we just had uh, flat prices across the day, here in Calgary, it's about 45 to 50% of all charging is done in the off peak hours. Those, those hours listed there. When we gave people a three and a half cent per kilowatt hour discount. So I'm not, we're not, they're not paying three and a half cents. That's three and a half cents off of like what is all in around 15 cents these days. So they're still paying around 11. Just that little discount, the share of off peak moved up to 80%. That's a massive treatment effect. So it, it suggests responsiveness that is unheard of in electricity demand right now. And this sort of speaks to how EVs are just so different in terms of ability to respond. It's super easy to do so. It's not not everyone. There's going to be some that have workplace charging or daytime. But for the large majority, at least of current uptake of EVs, that rate is going to get, you know, probably 90% of EVs charging shifted. There'll be some other homes. I saw some chatter on the internet of people with water heaters putting in timers. I've got other pilots where we're seeing that is extremely effective as well. The water tanked hot, hot water systems will probably shift as much as they can into the off peak. Um, obviously, there's a lot of load that you can't shift, but th this this will be very effective in shifting. Yeah. Do you I think, think that? Oh, go ahead. I, I, I'm going to say, do you think, I mean, anytime soon, and I know it's Alberta specific right now, but we're going to get time of use advantages for people like me and, and coming increasingly common. We've got solar systems on our roof. Mm -hmm. But right now, there is zero incentive to you know engage in any kind of arbitrage to put in a solar to put in a storage system yeah. and export to the grid when the pool price is the highest because no matter when those electrons flow out, then we're just getting the same rate. Do you see that cracking anytime uh, soon? Eventually. So we have two big barriers there. So one is lack of smart meters. We need interval meters that record the hourly flow of usage and export. Um, you probably have that with your uh, solar, but it's not ubiquitous around the province. Uh, it's it's rolling out. Uh, I'm also working with Fortis. Their rollout plan is by 2032, everybody will have one. We need that faster to take advantage of these things. Um, uh, ACO is running a pilot right now in Grand Prairie. So it's coming, but that's the first thing. The second would be we need our retailers, and that's kind of unique again here. We need retailers to have exposure to the household meter. So that way they can be really innovative in offering products that create those incentives, just like in the UK where they have that. And I don't know if you guys follow Octopus Energy. They're my favorite utility these days. Um, they, they're doing really innovative things in terms of incentivizing folks. And they can only do that because they have exposure to the household meter. So they have the incentive. Right now, if a retailer were to do something innovative with, with, with you, Ed, uh, what would they be doing? They would only be benefiting your wires provider. I, I don't know, in Canmore, maybe your Fortis or Atco. Um, they're only benefiting them because they face the average shape. So we need that we need to to put give exposure to the household. And we need to get those smart meters in place. 
that the fact that you said favorite utility betrays <laughs> a certain degree of geekiness <laughs> when it comes I have their to trading like card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Which is exactly why we wanted to have you on Lake Schaefer. And I apologize to everyone out there in EVC land. We have just run out of time after only two questions because they're such great questions. We know that there are a bunch more there. We can always try to continue this conversation offline in some sort of social media forum. But let me just say uh, on behalf of the three of us, thanks, Blake. Uh, this was terrific. Uh, you're a wonderful guest. And uh, we're really grateful to have had you on Energy Versus Climate today. Thanks for having me. All right. My standard outro. Remember that this episode will be available at energyversusclimate.com and on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Please review and rate us on your favorite podcast platform. That always helps new listeners to find the show. You can uh, always send your feedback to info at energyversusclimate.com. So we'll be back in May with our final episode of season four. Uh, the subject is still TBD, but we will let you know once we have that nailed down. Um, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and at energyversusclimate.com to be notified when that show is going to be scheduled. Thanks to Hannah Tai, Priya Kunikulato, Crystal Hickey, and as always, our producer, Eva Fuenijescu, for all their support. See you next time, everyone. Bye-bye.